Africans gave the freest world, the freest nation to the entire world. The only country in the world that did not allow slavery was Haiti. And not only did not allow it, but the only country in the world that put its natural resources towards fighting against any oppression was Haiti. Simon Bolivar, who liberated South America, anyone who knows the history knows it was Haiti that gave him the money, outfitted him with ships to start the struggle. And the Haitians demanded only one thing of Bolivar. When you free Venezuela, when you free Colombia, when you free Argentina, when you free Peru, free the slaves. The only condition of which they required of Simon Bolivar. This is history. You can't hide the truth, and if you know your history, you look for your history, you will find it. You can imagine the threat that history imposed, that Haiti imposed upon America since 1803. There was nothing that American imperialism, one other thing I must tell you. From this period, 1803, Haiti fought every major European power, the Americans, the French, the Spanish, the Germans, the Portuguese, all of them, trying to bring Haiti down, and not one of them could make Haiti renege on her democratic principles. On that country, there would never be on that territory a slave. Every man, every woman was free. You just make it to Haiti, and you're free. No slavery. Everywhere else, there was slavery. Everywhere else. 
in the great America. They were, well, let's not talk about that. So anyway, you could imagine the threat that Haiti posed. American imperialism, all of its life, had only one objective, to bring those slaves back onto the plantation. There was only one objective, bring those slaves back to the plantation. And America, France, all of them could not bring Haiti back to the plantation. Even after slavery was uh, made illegal throughout the Western Hemisphere and was even abandoned and emancipation proclamations were read everywhere, Haiti continued to be the guiding inspiration for Africans throughout the Western Hemisphere. It was not until 1915 that American imperialism could put the heels of the Marines on Haiti. Install Papa Doc, a scum of our race, one who would bow down to the wishes of imperialism and rape his people without the slightest mercy. And since then, that's where Haiti has been. And that's where it is to this day. And it's certainly not Bill Clinton who's going to liberate it. Just the masses of Africa. Greetings, everyone. We're so excited that you have joined us uh, for Pan-African Weekly News. My name is Monica. This is my comrade, Ronya Sawu. We are always excited to be with you here every Thursday at noon mountain time in Tiwa territory. That's so-called um, Albuquerque. And we are the African People's Revolutionary Party. And what the African all AAPRP works for and organizes for is the total liberation and unification of Africa under um, my son. Uh, <laughs> he threw me off. <laughs> under how a unified socialist Africa. And so there are chapters it started in Africa and Ghana. There are chapters in Africa. There are chapters all over the world. And we are about liberating our people no matter where we are um, under a one a unified socialist Africa because we know that African people, no matter where they are, are oppressed. Everything globally has been built off um, the exploitation of Africa. And we know once Africa is free, all of our people will be free everywhere we are. So what is this? This is Pan-African Weekly News. We want to make sure that our people and um, our people we do work in solidarity with have access to real information, revolutionary information, political education that will allow us to unpack, to learn, uh, and to unpack the lies that we are told so we're able to know the truth from our story. Um, what we also do on this, store, uh, on this space is we do a couple things. One is every show we call an ancestor in. That is critical because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. We would not be here if it wasn't for our ancestors fighting for our liberation, fighting for our existence as a people. And today we are calling in ancestor Marie Antoinette Declare, who uh, was a Haitian, go ahead and do that, was a Haitian um, um, organizer in, in Haiti uh, and was unfortunately on June 29th murdered herself as well as with her colleague who was a journalist, um, Diego Charles, um, in a car as she was dropping him off. Antona, she organized against the corruption and the injustice that was happening in Haiti against the Moist government. Um, that same night that she was murdered, um, there was other folks murdered in the community as well. Um, they were unfortunately slaughtered in the streets. And this is something that um, Marie Antoinette um, organized against continuously. Uh, she was very vocal about the dictatorship that was there. She was very vocal about imperialism and how imperialism impacts Haiti. That is this country, that is France, that is other countries and, and how that impacts Haiti. Um, she fought for change and for the liberation of Haiti. And we want to call her in this space as we continue to fight for the liberation of our people, as we um, remember the people of Haiti as well. We just thank you, Marie Antoinette, for your dedication to the revolution, and we continue the work that you are that you fought for. Um, thank you so much. We also on this show do land acknowledgement, and we don't do it as like performative. That's what we see a lot of people doing as it's performative. We don't just acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that this is indigenous land, that we are in Tiwa territory. We also organize in solidarity with our indigenous relatives to fight for their land back. We know that this land belongs to the indigenous people. No matter how long something has been stolen, it has to be returned. We know our land as Africans, our land is in Africa. 
um, and that land belongs to us. We know Palestinian lands belongs to Palestinians and we fight um, in solidarity for uh, indigenous people to have their land back. So it's not just about acknowledging it, it's what are we doing on a daily basis to ensure that indigenous people are getting their land back. Uh, today's show, we are so excited, is about how to build revolutionary media platforms. We have a guest with us who we're excited, who's gonna drop some knowledge and share some information that we're able to apply in what we do, right? all of us that are working on building revolutionary media platforms. So today we have us with us, Ramiro Sebastian Funes, I think I got it right, um, and who is an Honduran communist um, who does content, who's a content creator based out in Los Angeles. And we're gonna ask Ramiro if you can join us, so excited. Um, so the first question we have for you is who, who is Ramiro? Uh, how did you get involved in the movement? Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, by the way, it looks, the relationship you and your son have looks so beautiful. You guys, you're doing your activism and your radio show, and he has so much respect for you. And it looks like you have a beautiful home. And shout out to Comrade Oni for, for reaching out to me and, and having me join as well. Shout out to Comrade Erica, who's watching and listening, by the way. I really appreciate her work and her analysis. She's somebody who I have mad respect for. I have mad respect for, for y'all as well. Uh, I'm just a dude from New York. I'm, I was born in New York, born and raised in, I was born in Harlem, raised in Queens and Washington Heights for a few years, but I spent most of my life in Queens and Jamaica, Queens, and I studied journalism at St. John's University, a small private Catholic school in Queens, and I wanted to be a journalist when I was young. I saw all of the mainstream media. At first, I really fell into the promises of capitalism. I used to rock the suits and try to shave and be this clean cut, quote unquote, professional journalist in New York, in the city. And as I began working in mainstream corporate media, Daily News, New York One, all of these different mainstream media outlets, I began to have more of a class analysis. I began to see how media and journalism serves a purpose under capitalism and imperialism, but how it's an important weapon. Around this time, one of my biggest inspirations, Malcolm X, as I was reading about his work and following his life, he has this quote that says, basically, the media is most, the most powerful entity on earth. It will make you think that your friends are your enemies and your enemies are your friends. To this day, that is my favorite quote of all time and one that has stuck with me to this day. Media is one of the most powerful weapons on earth. The wars that we're seeing being carried out today are mediatic wars, are wars of information, wars of ideas. And so even though growing up in New York and trying to be this mainstream bourgeois journalist, I was disgusted at the current state of journalism, especially corporate mainstream news. I recognized how important it was as a weapon in the struggle against imperialism, against capitalism. Around this time in 2009, there was a coup in Honduras, a US-backed coup carried out under the administration of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, who Hillary Clinton to this day, I think is one of the most evil people on earth. And she just scares me, to be honest with you. <laughs> I would not want to see Hillary Clinton in person. Um, and she is somebody who has done really disgusting things, not only in Honduras, but in Haiti and Libya. Um, seeing the coup in Honduras, seeing the aftermath, also seeing the imperialist coup in Libya against Gaddafi, the destruction of the African continent. So many of these events w awoke in my political and class consciousness on an international level not just Occupy Wall Street, but also mainly the, the foreign invasions and the coups. And at that point, I realized that there was very little voice and room for anti-imperialist journalists in mainstream media through some of the different outlets that I tried working for and producing content for. A lot of them rejected stories that were anti-imperialist. A lot of them just didn't hit me up anymore. And so I realized after a while that, especially as social media was growing, that we need to, as anti-imperialists, as socialists, as communists, as pan-Africanists, as indigenous people, we need to create our own 
communications, our own platforms to battle against the empire, because this war is not just weapons and the ground level warfare that we've seen in the past decades. This is on a whole, this is ideological. The imperialist ruling class are waging ideological warfare against our people. And we have to be able to create a new medium. And so that's kind of how I got started. I'm just a dude from New York who is really into media. And now that's what I love doing. Thank you so much for sharing about yourself. All of that resonates deeply. We were just talking about in work study this week, a little bit about what you were sharing about like social media and like the messaging that it's controlling and like even the trends in Facebook of what is um, being posted now versus what was being posted when Trump was in, in, uh, was in office. And so those controlling messages, even with the pandemic, right? That's being a false, false messages and controlling messages that are being out. So like, thank you so much for sharing more about yourself and what brought you to the movement and the anti-imperialistic work that you do, the political education as well. Thank you. And to the point of media being used as a weapon by our enemies, like all of the situations you listed, like Honduras, Libya, Haiti, and each of those cases where when the United States is going to like overthrow their governments, they use media as a weapon. They propagandize against Gaddafi. They put like bald-based lies in the media. Hillary Clinton was instrumental in doing that, like putting bald-based lies in the media about him to spread the idea that he was a dictator, like killing his own people, like this is what they do. They use CNN, they use Fox News, they use MSNBC, they use the New York Times to spread a particular narrative to justify what they're doing to get people to go along with it. So super, super important point you just made. But next question I have for you is that you said you, um, you're really into building uh, media platforms that we control, the masses control. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about how does one go about building a revolutionary media platform? Like it's something that takes a lot of money. The biggest step is conceptualizing the idea from the very beginning, have a so having a solid idea of what you want to build, what you want to create. I've done media for several groups. I've created several media outlets and I've also worked for several media outlets. And so I have an idea of what it looks like from the beginning to end stage, but also once you're getting into a space, just to kind of back up a little bit. So I used to work at Telesur English in 2017 uh, in Ecuador, me and my girlfriend, Lived, moved there actually. Uh, my girl, shout out to my girlfriend Ophelia. She's uh, my comrade, my my partner, somebody who uh, has been through thick and thin with me. So I have a lot of appreciation for her. She's also in media and comms, and it's really cool to be able to to work with her. So I just want to acknowledge that as well. That it does help to have a partner who's supportive of creating content and media. So me and her, we moved to Telesur. Uh, to Ecuador in 2017. And I was an editor there. Um, it was a cool experience. The only problem was that one of the things I realized, and this is the case on the African continent as well, is that a lot of quote unquote experts who are white people and move to our countries will completely dominate and take over mediatic spaces. And so what you have in, the, in Africa, a lot of the times it tends to be for some reason, old white British dudes, I guess that's like their whatever, like whatever they're into, but they go into like Kenya and Tanzania and they're like reporting live from Kenya. And, and it's just like, why can't you have an African person doing that? You know, and, and so you, you see that happen with the BBC and mainstream media. And that that's the same situation in Latin America too, where you have like these random white people who, you know, and that's not to say like they're bad people, all of them, but it's just like, they go in more with a career aspect or aspirations to be on the quote unquote on the field, right? Which on itself already has a racist and imperialist connotation where like the civilized home with electricity and cooling and heat is like the first world. And then the field is like the global South, you know? So there's this kind of already imperialist nature to it. But what we quickly discovered is that a lot of white liberals dominate those spaces. A lot of white liberals from the US, from the UK, from Canada are speaking for our people, indigenous people, African people. And it's rare to find outlets that have centered African and indigenous people telling their own stories, telling their own point of view. And, and if there are, if that is the case, a lot of times they tend to be corporate media 
or they tend to be the quote unquote cleaned up people who are on corporate news and in the specific countries. And so being there, that just kind of opened my eyes to that realization, being an editor there and, and seeing in Telesud, like, wow, a lot of white liberals control the space. So even though like from a peer from the outside, you'll see like a certain media outlet or whatever that seems to be like coming from the South or, you know, it'll be more white liberal dominated. And that also controls the political line because once you start, once you start talking about land back and and Africa for Africans and Latin America for Latin America, you know, then they start getting a little uncomfortable, right? Um, so I, that's one of the things I noticed. So basically, being in Telesur and, and working there as an editor, writing articles and and doing social media and all that stuff, I was able to learn and see like how do I apply this to creating our own platform. In 2016, before we moved to Ecuador to work at Telesur, uh, I created Anticonquista. My girlfriend uh, was there as well. We both were part of that process of creating it in 2017 in Los Angeles. It, we were just at my apartment in, in Westlake in LA and we just little by little were building it. We moved to Ecuador and so we put that on hold temporarily because we were already, gonna, already doing that with Telesur English. Uh, once we left Telesur, English in 2018, 2017, 2018, when we realized it was kind of controlled and by a lot of white liberals and kind of honing back some of the more radical views. And we launched Anticonquista. We in included uh, two other people as part of the project initially. We expanded it as a, as a media collective. And eventually through that, we were able to raise a lot of money for groups all over Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, I Although I'm no longer with Anticonquista, I left earlier this year. Um, I'm doing my own stuff on my own channel right now. And I continue to do that work on YouTube mainly because articles and social media memes, I think are very important. You need to have that sort of content. But I think we live in an age where videos are king. People, There's people on TikTok, on YouTube, who are reaching the masses in a way that radicals and communists and anti-imperialists are not. And so that's what I dedicate myself to more so these days now. It's YouTube videos, creating content, because it's also more accessible. Unfortunately, a lot of our people won't take time to kind of sit down and read a full length manifesto or article. We have to adapt to the way people consume content, consume media. And so although I started off mainly creating graphic, that's also like one of the hobbies that I like doing is like graphic design like I created the Anticonquista logo a lot of the designs and uh, memes and stuff like that and I, I do enjoy that and I think we've entered an era where we've seen more people build that um, but I think now video is important but going back to your your question in terms of starting off I mean this is all stuff going back to what I was talking about with, with Telesur and and just seeing how it operates this is all stuff that anyone can do anybody can buy a website domain for 20 bucks and call it, you know, revolutionarynews.org and start that website, you know, and I've done that. And it's, I've seen that from beginning to end, create a website, create the social media accounts, have a few articles. You can start that up. That's totally possible. The biggest thing is just a matter of a having the vision and having an, a clear understanding of what you want to create and who you're catering to, who your audience is. That's the biggest factor because there are, there are so many leftist pages now millions of them out there um, but there's very few that cater specifically to African indigenous people or women or LGBT so you have to kind of have a general overview of what you want to focus on but then have a specific target audience that you want to cater to that's underserved and once you identify that and once you are able to grow and build it you can create all the content you want. I mean, it's just a matter of having the right vision, the consistency, who your who your people are. You have to know who your people are, who you're talking to. In my case, the people that I'm trying to reach are us. You know, people who are millennials or Gen Gen X or Gen Z or people who are sons of immigrants or immigrants who are just regular working class people. I'm not trying to reach people in academia. I'm not trying to reach white liberals. I'm not trying to reach other sectors of the population. I'm just trying to reach people like us who come from the hood, from working class communities, who are just everyday black, brown people who understand that there's a problem in the world with capitalism and imperialism. 
and how do we create mediatic alternatives? Like the fact that we're doing this now, people are watching us now and they're not watching NBC or CNN or Fox. I think that's a big win. We, everyone, like right now, if you have, I have this iPhone, everyone, this is a TV studio right in your hands. And so that's one of the contradictions of capitalism that Lenin talks about, right? That under capitalist, the one of the contradictions of capitalism is that even though we're more oppressed under imperialism and, and, and capitalism, the technology has gotten so high that as a working class, we can appropriate that technology and use it for our own liberation, create our own networks, create our own tools. And so that's really what it is. How do we get from being consumers of media to just endlessly scrolling? Because I've been there too, and I'm not going to lie. I've been just on that dark hole of just Instagram, you know, the explore, just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. How do we get from like being just consumers, because that's where the white capitalist imperialists want us to be. They want us to just consume media, buy their movies, buy their content. They don't want us producing stuff. So how do we get to a point where we're producing our own stuff and have our people listen to us? So that's kind of where I'm approaching this from. Right. And so, yeah, like, that's like precisely how we started Her Communist. I asked the question, and I kind of already knew the answer because I'd done it. But when we were starting Her Communist, I had never done that before. And I was like, I don't know if it's going to work. But we had a clear vision in mind of like who we wanted to talk to. I knew how yeah. to make a website. We had like the money, like it was like a, like probably like 150 bucks to get started. So like, it was just a group of us being like, okay, we want to write articles that young African people are going to want to read. And that's, like, yeah. that's how we started it. And it worked. Like once mm. people realize you're talking to them and you're talking about things that they're not going to get anyone else, they like, they come through, they follow you. Um, but we actually got a question in the chat for you that's a good follow-up to this, this that previous question, if it's okay. Someone's yeah. asking, how can we get help with the process of setting up the website and content? I, I think that the first thing, um, you hit on a good point, right? I think the first thing is coming up with, before even getting the website, um, just a step before that, Hood Communist as a name. It's a beautiful name. I've always loved that name from the very beginning. I think it's amazing. I love, first of all, shout out to Hood Communist, one of the best uh, media outlets out there, independent. Once you have a name, the second you hear Hood Communist, you're like, wow, that's me. That's, I wanna follow that. So it's so important from the very beginning to really hone in on the name because that's gonna determine. And again, I don't wanna be those like, white marketing people who are like, we got to get the brand right. We need to make sure our brand recognition is, you know, but to a degree, like there's some element of truth to that because we do live as a human species. One, one thing that distinguishes us from other animals in the animal kingdom is our ability to recognize symbols and communicate with symbols. That's something that in our evolutionary cycles has allowed us to advance certain symbols the hammer and sickle, you see that symbol all over the world. You already know what that person's about, what that person's fighting for. And so it's the same thing with revolutionary media. You have to really hone in on what, what name you're using, what logo you're using, so that if you look at it and right away, boom, you know what that's about. And so once you have that name, that unique name, and it, it should be something that is unique and, and not taken, right? There are so many pages already that are like, you know, liberation or or revolution, you know, you have to kind of like mix it up because we're at a point now where it's, we're kind of saturated with media as well. So you have to really come up with something unique and creative. Once you do that, my suggestion is to check to see on website hosting sites if it's taken already or not, because that is going to determine a lot. You want it to be consistent. You have to think, apply the methods of the capitalists, but to a revolutionary point of view, to be like, okay, we have to come up with a name that nobody has that is unique, that is not taken on any of the handles, that has website availability. Once you select it and choose it, keep going with it, get the domain, right? You buy the hosting site. WordPress is probably one of the best sites to use for hosting, I would suggest. I think it's like 25 bucks or something. Um, you get your website host domain, you can start posting articles. I think the biggest thing is once you buy the domain with the name that you have, you can, it's pretty easy to build a site. There, my biggest advice is YouTube. Excuse me. There's so many videos on YouTube that are tutorials that show you how to code and, and how to set up a basic website. There's so many resources out there that are free and available online. And we just have to be able to tap into that and use it. 
and building a WordPress website these days, there's so much information about that online. So it does take a little bit of work. It does take a little bit of finessing, but it's totally doable. And once you have that WordPress site up, then you can start opening your social media accounts. You can create articles, you can create graphics. Canva is another great site for those of you who don't have Photoshop. Like I use Photoshop and Premiere, I have Adobe, but not everybody's able to access that. So you can use a website like Canva or Fotor that has free photo editing and free, very simple video editing that you can use to create. So all of the processes and of creating content are available online for free in some way or another. It's just a matter of being able to correctly utilize them. But yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I also, um, I think websites are important. It just depends also on what kind of content you want to create. To be honest with you, I don't think, uh, unless you're specifically focusing around articles, if you're mainly focusing on like videos or podcasts, I don't necessarily think you even need a website. Like a lot of times people don't necessarily go to like the website of the organization. They follow somebody or something through YouTube or social media. So it really depends on what, what your product is, right? If your product is articles, then sure, you should set up a WordPress. But if you're mainly focusing on like videos or podcasts, then I would suggest looking at those platforms. Thank you so much. You make me think about uh, when um, we first started Pan African Weekly News and we were testing it. My son had my phone and he was on YouTube and I guess the video popped up. <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I wasn't even subscribed to the channel. And he was like, mom, look, Arya Sabu is talking about <laughs> revolutionary work. Look at this. And so like he, you know, saw it, you know? And so like you said, where are the users? You know, where are the community who are we trying to reach? And then I have young people who send me TikTok videos all the time. I'm not on TikTok, but mm. man, I think I need to get on it. But there's yep. a lot of artists um, that they send talking about really deep stuff, um, sometimes in a funny way, but it's real issues. So it's like, what's the platform and what's the, like, the design, you know, to reach, to reach community? And so I'm like, keep sending me these videos because I'm getting idea. I'm going to be on TikTok one day. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Um, and someone just asked me in the chat, if, what if you have a telegram? Does that require a website? No. Um, so after we got, <laughs> after the hook communist got kicked off Twitter for no reason, <laughs> we yeah. were like, we're not ever going to go back there because Twitter kind of sucks. Um, so, but we decided to, Telegram is basically like a group chat. It's like WhatsApp. And it allows you to create channels where you can just like post out and like have voice chats and now you can have video mm. chats. And so it's basically just like a giant, a giant group chat with like one-way conversation. And so you can set that up like right now. You just download Telegram, create the group, create the link to it, and share it. You do not need a website to do that. You just need a way to share the link with people. We put it on, like, you know, Facebook and Instagram and got people that way. But now you don't need a website to have a Telegram group. It's, like, all on your phone anyway, so people wouldn't even go to the website. To <laughs> That's so. Um, then, Monika, did you have the next question? Nice. Yes, I did. Why is it important for – you talked about this a little bit, but if you could elaborate – why is it important for anti-imperialistic movements to have media platforms that we control? It's important for anti-imperialist movements to have a media presence because the impact, the strategies, the tactics of imperialism are getting more sophisticated by the day. We, we've seen the strategies of imperialism going back into history. It's interesting to study because the imperialists have used media since the 1800s and 1900s, we can go back to the Monroe Doctrine, the political cartoons, that, that was the first examples of media that they used, where they openly used the white savior complex. They're like Manifest Destiny, that famous portrait of that random white lady with the torch, like flying or whatever, you know, that those, those are the first examples of media being used to promote imperialism where they created this uh, concept of the light and white people and, and European civilization versus the darkness and savagery and, and people of color. So those images have created reality. And the, it, it, it's interesting because there's that saying, right, that if you repeat something often, often enough, it can become reality. And there's some element of truth to that. That's why when you go to the doctor and you're sick, 
and you get a diagnosis or a prescription, once the doctor writes, you have this and you need this, it kind of becomes reality, right? It kind of manifests. And so it's one of those things where with media, once you repeat something, once you control the narrative, once you control ideas and information that people get, you control in a way what we interpret as reality, right? One of the things that we were talking about prior to the stream is the fact that there are so many revolutionary anti-imperialist groups in Honduras and in Haiti, the two most impoverished countries in the Western hemisphere, but we almost never hear about them because nobody has access to high-speed internet. Nobody has access to graphic design. Very few people have access to content creation tools. And so because we're not seeing and hearing them with our senses, it makes it seem like it doesn't exist in reality. But in reality, it does exist, but we're just not being able to see it. So that's where the power of media is. Like what we see in here controls our conception of reality. And so by dominating media, you're in a way dominating what people believe to be reality. And so in terms of imperialism, ever since the 1800s, the, the dominant narrative has been, you know, us whites, we have to save the world from savagery. We have to lift people into civilization. That's where you have the Rudyard Kipling, the white man's burden, all this racist nonsense from successful roads and all these people. And then that's where the road scholarship comes from, by the way, if anybody has gotten the road scholarship. Um, so you have that, right? Then you, then into the 1920s after the Soviet Union, after the Russian Revolution, you had Red Scare. You had a very fearful propaganda by the imperialists that was like, the, you know, they would have images of fire and, and communists eating babies and very scary stuff portraying communism as this evil thing, diabolical. Because again, the, the culture at that time was very still religious, more conservative. They're like, the world's gonna burn and they're evil and they're, they're radical, right? So that was the way imperialist media operated between around the early 1900s to about 1946, 1947. There was a big change around 1947 because 1947 was the year that the Congress for Cultural Freedom was created by the CIA. This was a program launched by the first Israeli intelligence, Mossad, as a year before the quote unquote state of Israel was created. And the tactics of imperialism totally changed. The media propaganda totally changed because instead of pushing people, uh, instead of creating this narrative that communism was radical, was revolutionary, beware of communism, they flipped it and they made communism seem conservative, seem uh, authoritarian, and they painted liberals and capitalists as progressive and pro-democracy. And that's where the color revolution style pro imperialist propaganda techniques began coming up. The techniques that we saw in Libya, for example, right? What did we see? We saw that in Libya, they portrayed Gaddafi as conservative, as, as a sexist, chauvinistic, as uh, backward, right, as reactionary, as a status quo, and they portrayed the Wahhabis, the, the actual reactionaries, the actual conservatives, the actual imperialists, they portrayed them as pro-democracy and peaceful and progressive. So there's a, a total switch in the technique because you had people like Edward Bernays, people like Spignu Brzezinski, who realized, look, by scaring the crap out of people, and saying communism is, is radical and revolutionary, we're actually pushing people toward it, right? It's kind of like when you have that parent that's like, don't go to this place, that place, there's a lot of crazy people doing crazy stuff. You're like, hmm, I kind of want to check out that place now, right? Like when, when someone tells you that. So that's kind of the effect that imperialist propaganda had in the early 20th century. So they're like, look, we can't make it cool. We have to flip the script. We're cool, Western liberal values and, and hipster uh, color revolutions are cool. The socialist and anti-imperialist countries, they're the backward ones. They're the reactionary ones. So there was a flip uh, flip uh, switch in the second half of the 20th century. I would argue we're still in that period now. Now we're kind of entering the period of woke imperialism, of the imperialist media trying to include as many people of color faces as possible. And you have to question that because the liberals and the Democrats will be like, oh, well, that's a seat at the table, representation matters. But it's like, no, you have to sit down. Why is Netflix coming out with all these shows about black and brown people? 
why are imperialist media putting out all this stuff? You know, politicians, AOC, Kamala Harris, like you have to sit back and question, like, why are they doing that? Because if it were up to them, they would prefer for it to be all old white men, right? That's that's how they had it before. And, and that's what they would prefer, I think. But they're doing this for a reason to to bait people in, to be like, look, we're this intersectional empire that is uh, inclusive of all people because they know that they have to appease the masses in one way or the other. The Roman Empire did the same with the colonization of the Middle East and Northern Africa with this concept that they had called the noble lie, where they told people in North Africa and what is modern day Tunisia and Algeria and also people in modern day Palestine and Lebanon, that they can move to Rome, they can become patricians, they can be a Roman a senator, right? That's where that term senator comes from, the Roman Senate. They can be that if they want to, if they work hard enough. But in reality, the, the, the real Romans knew that it was impossible, but it was the noble lie that they used to keep people in control, to keep people in check from not developing their own political systems, their own media, their own apparatus. And so in terms of the importance of anti-imperialist movements creating their own media, that's exactly the reason why, because the imperialists are constantly changing their strategies, their techniques, they're adapting to new ways of how people think and react. And the anti-imperialist movements have to do the same. We have to get to a point where we're creating our own media, where, where we can point out and be like, look, all this stuff they're talking about, inclusion and diversity, it's all crap. Like, they don't really mean that. You know, we, we're telling our own stories, we're saying our own perspectives. And this is what they're trying to do to control you. So for every, we have to be ahead of them. We can't just kind of sit back and only deconstruct or debunk their media. We have to create our own media where we're creating our own faces, our own perspectives. I mean, this is definitely a start. More people would rather watch this than something on CNN or MSNBC that they know is complete nonsense. And that's why I'm optimistic as well, because we live in the age of authenticity. We live in an age where people want real people, real stories. They don't want some standard talking points on mainstream media of just people blabbing on about Democratic Party talking points. They want real people talking the way we are now. And so that's why it's important to continue to build anti-imperialist media, because that's the only way we're going to defeat this empire of imperialism and, and capitalism. You can also already see the success of, of us creating our own platforms and putting out our own voices and our own narratives and our own analysis. Like, I feel like someone like Kamala Harris, like that would have been a much more successful strategy just a few years ago. People would have been buying what she was selling, but because she came out and all of these revolutionary African people, radical African people or social justice minded African people were like, girl, bye. And like, just like breaking her down completely. Right. Like she never had a chance. And now they just like have her off in a corner. Every so often she comes out, we clown her and then she goes back to the corner. So like it didn't it didn't work. Like they tried to do Obama again, but because we had our own platforms to say we reject this person, they're not able to use her that way anymore. So I feel like what you're saying is true, and that we do actually have the power um, to change the narrative, but we just need to organize it and deploy it. Um, but you mentioned earlier that Anti Conquista had raised like quite a bit of money for um, anti colonial and anti imperialist struggles in Central and South America. And I wanted to talk to you about how revolutionary media, like how y'all did that and how revolutionary media in general can be used to act in solidarity with anti-imperialist struggles. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, the biggest thing is just being able to produce content, have a PayPal link, have a Patreon link, have any form of way for people to be able to donate money, donate funds for the content that you create, because it is labor. A lot of people don't realize how much work and time and effort goes into writing an article, creating a social media meme, even creating a short one or two minute video can take hours if you want it to be on point, if you want it to look good. So there is labor that is being produced. And I think sometimes it's hard for people to acknowledge that in an era where we're overstimulated with social media and media in general, we can scroll through different shows and posts in a matter of seconds, but we don't recognize how much labor and time goes into producing that. And so when you make that clear with your audience and you make it clear that it does take work, it does take effort to produce content and that value is being produced, you can direct people to be able to compensate that to help fund groups in anywhere all over the world, domestically, locally, that are actually carrying out those goals and those 
decisions and fighting. And it's a way of, in a way, giving back, like putting your money where your mouth is of being able to support groups and, and finance them that are, that need help, you know? So it, it's one of those things that by creating content, by raising funds, you can use those funds and send that to people who actually need the help because at, in Haiti, for example, one of the big things is that like people, a lot of people don't have phones, a lot of people, or if they do have phones, it's like old school phones that are not even smartphones that they can't produce media. And that's one of the things that in Haiti, like the, the uprisings, the ongoing national liberation struggle we see would be so much more successful. Imagine if every Haitian that was protesting was able to have an iPhone like this, where they can create more content where they can create and distribute more stuff and organize because that, that's an organizing tool as well that's how the russian revolution was organized by the newspaper iskra revolutions are organized around media and agitation and, and propaganda and so if you're able to help people in the global south with having access to those materials with the content that you create then that's so that's such a great thing to do and, and it's something that a lot more people uh, should be doing. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why it's also important from the beginning to really be clear about why you're working, wh why you're doing something, right? That I think it's something important. Like, if you're going to be producing media and content and putting all these hours in to create stuff, who are you? Who are you doing it for? Why are you doing it? And for what reason? And the reasons can change from time to time, but you just have to be clear about it. And again, right, going back to what we were talking about in the beginning, unfortunately, there are a lot of white liberals in the global north who see the struggles of our people as just a hustle, to be real with you. Like, it's their hustle. They're like, oh, I'm on the I'm on the Haiti beat. I'm on the Africa beat, you know, and you're kind of just like perpetually in that cycle where you're covering what's going on and you're, quote unquote, bringing awareness but then there's no solution. There's no out. There's no way to be like, okay, here's a problem. If you want to actually help, like, here's what you can do, you know, and also being straight up, like with people, like uh, that's why for me personally, even on my personal channel, I don't collect money for my stuff. I'm not trying to monetize that you know in fact um something that i've been trying to do on my channel is in honduras um for the for garifuna community for the linka community as well that have been on the forefront of the fight against imperialism and poverty um and that's really my purpose but also to get information out there as well um but you have to be clear about what you want and transparent that's what people that's what it comes down to is just being transparent about what you want, who you're working for, why you're doing it. Because I'm not going to lie, like when I see some of these white journalists in the US or the UK that are making covering, they're covering all the right things and they're saying all the right words, but then all of that energy and attention is going back to their Patreon, going back to the PayPal. You're kind of like, huh, like that's kind of sus, right? Like you kind of have to take a pause and, and do that. So I'd rather be straight up with people. I'm like, look, I, I don't want a single penny. If you want to support, if you generally want to support, I'll direct you to the right people who are actually doing work. And that's what I prefer to do. And that's the model that that I've been initiating, you know? Um, and so that that's kind of like my advice is like, just really think about it as what people have and don't have. Understanding strengths and weaknesses, like we're all an anti-imperialist family, right? If I'm working, for example, like with the, our, our people in Haiti, right? Obviously for me, and this is something I joke around with Ophelia, uh, my girlfriend all the time, where I'm like, look, if I if I were to engage in armed struggle or armed combat, I'll be real with you, I wouldn't last five or 10 minutes to be, I'm not trained in that, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not gonna act and LARP and be like, oh, I'm Rambo, like holding up guns. Like, that's just not who I am, you know? I'm, what I'm good at, what I'm good at doing is I'm good at producing media. I'm good at shooting videos. I'm good at graphic design or whatever. So use your strengths and talents for what is needed at that moment. It reminds me of the, the Cuban revolution. One of the things that was one of the debates and struggles between Fidel Castro and, and Che Guevara was that uh, Che Guevara, you know, he was a, a trained doctor, right? From Argentina. He was um, somebody who had a lot of medical experience and in the Cuban revolution, there were a lot of times where he was asking Fidel, like, put me on the front lines. I want to be in direct combat. 
And Fidel's like, dude, you're the only doctor here. We need you to be like wrapping wounds. We need you to be in the back chilling. Like, and, and there was a moment where Che Guevara understood that that was his revolutionary duty. And you have to have that revolutionary discipline to be like, you know what, maybe I don't need to be going out there and yelling for three hours and, 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 and being like, you know, at the, like dressing up and fighting people. Like maybe I'm best suited, you know, creating graphic design or, or creating video. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, don't let people, don't let people bully you into like, oh, you have to be yelling and protesting every single hour of the day to be quote unquote doing something, you know? And that's not to say you shouldn't do that. That's, that stuff is still needed. But it's just understanding where your strengths and weaknesses lie and adapting that and to be like, yo, for people in Haiti, for example, who are protesting, who are on the front lines, who are in direct combat with police on a day to day struggle, like that's that's what they do best. What can I do? I can create dope graphics for them. I can create dope videos for them. I can do this. And that symbiosis creates a beautiful harmony where you get so much more done. Instead of everyone trying to do the same thing, you should just strategize together and be like, you do that, I do this, we'll work together and, and we'll move forward, you know? That's so good. That was so good. Because we talk on the show all the time about how when you build a revolution, it's not just like the pow pow part. Like you have to organize every sector of society. And if you're organizing every sector of society from like the nanas to the babies, not everybody's going to do the same thing. People have to find their own lane. People have to find their own way to contribute. And that's okay. We don't all have to do the same thing. We just have to figure out what our role to play is. And every single one of us, all the people watching, all the folks on this call have a role to play. So I really appreciate that perspective. Yes. One yeah. last point I, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. One last point, a quick point on that I just want to mention. You also have to find something that doesn't exhaust you. Because at the end of the day, too, like you do have to look out for the collective 100 percent. You do look have to do stuff for the movement. There is selflessness that it goes into. Right. Because we could just be regular people who don't care about problems. And I'm just doing me. I'm just trying to get this bread and survive. Like we could be those people, but we're not. But you also have to balance it. You have to get to a point where you're not burning yourself out, because I've seen that happen a lot where people get mad hype. They're like, I want to do this. I want to do that. And they're like 24 seven dedicating their lives, but then they get burnt out because they're giving, they're not taking care of themselves. So you also, you also have to get to a point where you're like, okay, like this is my limit. This is what I can do this week and, and be, have a healthy relationship too. Cause otherwise you're going to get burnt out. That's real healthy relationship, self care for yourself, self care, community care, and everyone has a role in the movement, find your role and get involved. Um, so speaking about movement, thank you so much for your contributions and the work in the movement. What are your latest and upcoming projects and where can folks see your work? Uh, I will, I appreciate speaking with both of you comrades. It's always a pleasure. And I love, first of all, I just want to say, I love the maturity that both of y'all have in terms of political organizing and just the positiveness, the, the positive mindedness, because I'm not going to lie, like, I've been, I, I would say I've been a, a communist, an anti-imperialist for like about 10 years now. And one of my biggest uh, pet peeves are people who are very ultra left or dogmatic or people who are very like ego driven or treated like high school drama. I hate that. I, it's so annoying to me. And speaking with y'all is so refreshing because you're real people. And that's how it is. Pe real people who are, are struggling and, and trying to get by. It's not a game for them. It's not high school. Like, oh, did you hear about what this person did or what that person did? You know, it's just real life. And, and I, I do appreciate that. And, and it is a pleasure speaking with y'all about that. Um, in terms of projects that uh, I've been working on, I mean, my latest uh, documentary, Nicaragua Against Empire, I was in Nicaragua in March on a delegation for Sanctions Kill Coalition and Friends of the ATC, the Rural Workers Association, in solidarity with the Sandinista Revolution. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we hear a lot about uh, Venezuela and we hear a lot about Cuba and I have mad love for my sisters and brothers in Venezuela and Cuba. Obviously I support both revolutions, uh, but unfortunately a lot of people have failed to show Nicaragua solidarity and, and Nicaragua has been in the the quote unquote troika of tyranny or the, the axis of resistance in Latin America since 1979. Daniel Ortega, who's the president today, he was really good homies with Maurice Bishop. I mean, he was some, he's some, 
uh, Daniel Ortega is the last president who's alive today that came to power in a guerrilla movement. You know, like he he's somebody who has seen it all. He's seen Fidel, he's seen the Cuban Revolution. He was tortured. He was a guerrilla, indigenous guerrilla fighter who is now president and is still president, still resisting sanctions. And so I felt it was important to showcase Nicaragua with this documentary uh, because it gets overlooked as well. I mean, I have the same uh, the same critique of people who always overlook Zimbabwe as well. You know, when they're talking about anti-imperialist resistance, people who over who forget about Haiti in the Latin American solidarity movement, Haiti always gets left behind and it's not right. You know, Haiti is the mother of revolution in the Western hemisphere. And so that's that's my goal is to hike, highlight and showcase a lot of the uprisings within the minority, within the minority, the oppressed within the oppressed. And even in Honduras as well, my, my native country of Honduras, like Honduras is suffering very hard right now, but the people who are suffering even harder and the most are Garifuna and indigenous people who almost never get spotlighted as well. You know, so that's another thing. That's another project that I'm hoping to do, uh, hoping to do a documentary on Honduras, more specifically on the Garifuna community. Um, but that's my latest documentary, Nicaragua Against Empire. It's on my YouTube channel. You can just look up Ramiro. I'm like one of the few people uh, on YouTube with the name Ramiro, R-A-M-I-R-O. My stuff will come up. I do a stream uh, called Unmasking Imperialism uh, every few days or so. And I also produce educational videos about communism and that's how people can find me. Thanks so much for joining us. I dropped in the chat, <clears throat> excuse me, the Nicaragua with Empire documentary. Um, I actually watched that, that documentary and I learned so much. I feel like every time I learn more about a uh, country attacked by imperialism, I realize how, how little I know. Like it happened when mm -hmm. I went to Cuba, I was like, wow, I don't know anything. And when I watched the direct documentary, I was like, wow, everything I know about Native Rock is true. So <laughs> I really appreciate the work you do. I appreciate you uplifting Garifuna people, the revolutionary organizing that's happening in Honduras and Guatemala and Nicaragua among Garifuna people. People should learn from because it's very important strategies, especially around media. So we appreciate you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. You are an incredible comrade. You're very brilliant. People are showing you mad love in the chat because you were dropping so much knowledge. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank I'm you. excited. Love you all. To Have a great week as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love y'all. Have a great day. See ya. That was so dope. It was pretty good. He was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so much. But yeah, yeah. I, I learned so much in that space. And I'm looking forward to watching this documentary that you just posted in the chat and others of, of his work as well. I rec definitely cannot recommend that documentary highly enough because Nicaragua is one of those nations that the U.S. empire like consistently attacks across administrations, but people don't really talk about it. And it's also one of those nations where they like spread the propaganda that it's like a dictatorship, that they're oppressing their own people and all these kind of things to, like justify what they're doing. So like the truth that's dropped in that documentary, like the actual society that revolution built in Nicaragua is so important for us to learn about and then defend. Um, so that was the political education segment of the show, and I apologize for the audio issues. I have like a hot, a hot, like a shortcut button to press to mute myself, and I just forgot to mute myself. But thanks y'all for letting me know. But we can move on um, with the rest of the show. Did you wanna, you have to drop soon, huh, Monica? Yeah, I'll be dropping in a couple minutes. Okay, so I can um, I can do the, uh, unless you wanna do the Fourth of July report back, if you wanna share. No, I'm gonna I'm chill in here and, and pop in a little bit. <laughs> So um, that was the political education segment with our comrade Ramiro. Again, check out that link to the, the Nicaragua documentary that we dropped in the chat. Please watch it. You can watch the whole thing for free. You will learn a lot. And then go check out the rest of that comrade's videos on YouTube, um, especially the Unmasking Imperium series. Eric has been on it. I have been on it. Our comrade Ymir, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, has been on it. All breaking down how imperialism functions, how it lies to us. So please check out his channel. So let's move on to the next segment of the show. We want to talk about what's going on here in Tiwa territory with our organizing. First up, last Sunday, we had a very successful and beautiful 4th of July. Obviously, July 4th is U.S. Independence Day. We do not celebrate that mess. And so we had our own commemoration of the resistance of African, Indigenous, Chicano, and colonized people to U.S. imperialism called 4th of July. We had, like, how many people come through? Like, it was at least, like... A hundred. It was over a hundred. 
400. It was so beautiful. It was like elders, families, people from the block all coming together. We had speakers um, from revolutionary organizations doing work in Tiwa territory like us, the Brown Berets, La Raza Unida, the Hookup. It was so good. Speakers, music. So we also burned a flag. The way we did it is we cut up this like the biggest flag I've ever seen, y'all. Like I don't even know where this came from. Someone donated it. We appreciate the comrade that gifted it for the space. Thank you. <laughs> but it was like a huge flag. We cut it into strips. We handed out the strips. And then we had the people throw the strips in the fire. So we had a collective flag burning. And my favorite part of the whole thing was these indigenous aunties, they like spit on it, wiped their butts with it, and then threw it in the fire. I was like, woo! <laughs> that is the That's energy. Beautiful. That is the energy we were trying to create today. We appreciate you. Um, so it was a very, very good event. We had a very tight security team, like only one incident the whole day. And the dude, it was like, you know, some European dude got in his feelings, trying to like, keep, when the flag burning was happening, he tried to like walk through the event. And he was immediately surrounded by folks that agreed to help with safety and like, and he just left. And that was like the only yeah. incident. So it was just very well organized and beautiful. And I want to add, we were at um, Filtercom Park and a lot of our unsheltered relatives live there. And so we were in community with them um, sharing food, sharing popsicles, sharing water, and sharing political education, music, and poetry. So it was beautiful to be in the park amongst the amongst with our people as well, knowing that we are in a shared community and we are in a shared space. And that was so critical and so important because too many times we see our people being swept out of um, these parks as well as being kicked out just because um, events and space are there. That's where they live. So we were in community with them. Absolutely, they were part of the event, they were fed, they listened to the speakers. So it was just very, very great to have a space that was so welcoming for everybody in that neighborhood. Um, so very, very grateful they were able to do in-person voice will lie again. Also, I don't know if you saw this, but there was like a really big monarch butterfly that like flew through the middle of the event. I had never seen one in person before until Sunday. How beautiful, I missed that. Whoa, that has to be a symbol of someone, right? I was like, I take it. That's a good sign. But yeah, it was just a very, very great event. Thank you so to everybody that came through for Fourth of the Lie. Thank you to all of the organizations. It was literally like eight, nine organizations working together to put that together. Um, and it was just, you could see all the love that went into it. Um, so I just feel very full to this day from that event. Thank you. I'm going to be jumping off now. Glad to be part of that report out. Look forward to catching the rest of the show. Cool. See you later, Monica. Bye. All right, so I'll take us home. So that was what the lie happened last Sunday. It was a very great event. Was we the intent, the political intent of Fourth of the Lie as an event that we do every year is to make anti-American nationalism like a mainstream thing. Like usually, or sometimes when we as like revolutionaries, we as people in socialist organizations engage in criticism of imperialism, it can feel like we're just like talking amongst ourselves. And the intent of Fourth of the Lie is to create like a family-friendly, community-friendly, accessible space where regular people can come through and talk about the truth about the United States. Like sometimes people say anti-American nationalism is like ultra left. I've heard that critique before, but we, like I said, we had like elders, we had babies, we had mothers, fathers, children, all in that space talking about how the United States sucks, talking about our resistance to the US empire. So you can actually make anti-American nationalism mainstream you can like propagate that politic amongst regular people. You just got to do the work to create a space where they're welcome. That's what we did. So that's like the political intent of that event. I want to touch on very quickly. Also, things coming up in for Chihuahua Territory, APEP New Mexico organizing. We have our monthly Pan-African film series happening this coming Saturday at 2 p.m. We're going to be showing Summer of 67. Summer of 67 is an AB, I think it's ABC or NBC. It doesn't really matter. They're both lies. But it's a, it's a news documentary about the uprising that took place in Detroit against police violence in the summer of 1967. For folks that are familiar with the history, you know that there was one of just dozens of uprisings in majority African cities throughout the United States um, in response to terrorism, in response to the violence of capitalism and imperialism. And so that documentary is like new, like literally like broad news footage from that uprising as well as some very bourgeois racist analysis from ABC News that we're going to be deconstructing. But we wanted to talk about that movie because last summer we saw a global uprising um, for after the murder of George Floyd that spread across the entire world. That was perhaps the biggest in history. And then we saw all of the energy redirected back 
into the capitalist system, back into electoral politics. And so this is like a cycle that has been repeating for decades, for decades, for generations. And so we want to go back in time a little bit, look at the, one of the previous times it happened and how that unfolded and how we can maybe do things differently in the future. So check that out this coming Saturday at 2 p.m. I am very excited to announce that I will not be facilitating that movie. It's going to be Comrades Monica, Kendra, and Afro Phoenix, and I will be behind the scenes. You will not see me talking. I am very excited about that. I'm very excited. So shout out to the Comrades. Join us Sunday at 2 p.m on all of the platforms that you watch the show on. So APIP New Mexico Facebook, APIP New Mexico Twitter, and APIP New Mexico YouTube channel is where you can watch the Pan-African Film Series this Saturday, 2 p.m. Mountain Time, which is 4 p.m. Eastern Time, which I believe is 1 p.m. Pacific. I don't know, you could write it yourself, but 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Other things happening in Tiwa territory, we are having another event at the Pan-African Community Garden this coming Sunday at 4 p.m. So please come through if you are not here to. Uh, last time we had an event at the garden, we went around the circle and talked about what the U.S. meant to us. And Avery was like, it's about nothing but capitalism, fast food, and pigs. And the other youth were like, I don't like the United States. And we had people saying, like, you know, I'm ambivalent. And some people saying there's opportunities here. But the youth were aflame with anti-American sentiment, and it was really beautiful. And then, of course, we talked about why we do force the lie, like I just mentioned. And so the, the, the event, garden event, this coming Sunday at 4, Monica is going to be facilitating a conversation about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. Mobilizing is when you get a bunch of people together for a march and you go down the street and you yell and you chant. And organizing is when you do long-term systemic work to build power and political education within a given area. So Monika's gonna go in depth about why we are organizers and not mobilizers and what the difference is this coming Sunday at four. We're also gonna be planting some pumpkins, two pumpkin plants. We're gonna be making some signs for the garden so people can walk by and know like what the heck is happening if no one's there. So it should be a good time. Please come through Sunday at four and a flyer will be posted on our social media platforms shortly. Also, we have been making deliveries of care packages to elders in Tiwa territory for over a year at this point. We started in March of 2020 at the beginning of the first lockdown for the pandemic, um, making deliveries every single Saturday of packages containing food, masks, medicine sometimes, as well as political education. We are continuing that program for the foreseeable future because contrary to popular belief, the pandemic is not over. People are still dying, particularly elders, particularly colonized people. So we're gonna keep making those deliveries every single Saturday. If you know an elder in Tiwa territory that would benefit from a delivery on a Saturday afternoon, you can hit us up at 505-295-0008 or send us an email at apipnewmexico at gmail.com and we'll get them on a list of deliveries. Uh, what else, what else? Oh yeah, also, so um, we've had so far two car caravans in solidarity with Cuba calling for an end to the US blockade here in Tiwa territory. They happen on the last Sunday of every month, not just in Tiwa territory, but all over the world these caravans are happening. They started in Havana, they spread to the United States, they're also happening to Canada, they're also happening in Europe, they're also happening in Central and South America, so it's truly a global movement these Cuba Solidarity car caravans. And so we're gonna have the next one here in Cuba territory on Sunday, July 25th at 12 p.m. We're gonna be meeting at the El Mesquite parking lot on San Pedro and Central. So not the one on the west side, the one in the international district. Sunday, July 25th, 12 p.m. El Mesquite parking lot on San Pedro and Central. We will have some speakers. We'll have some lit Cuban music. We will have decorating materials for you to decorate your car with Cuba Solidarity messages. And then we'll be cruising up and down Central, making a lot of noise and causing a ruckus so people will look at our cars. So if that sounds like a good time to you, or if you just want to show up in solidarity with Cuba the way that Cuba shows up in solidarity with the world, join us Sunday, July 25th at 12 p.m. the Mesquite parking lot on San Pedro and Central. Also, I see like y'all are having like very deep conversations in the chat during the show. Like I saw the debate about the origin of intersectionality and whether we can use like intersectionality as a concept. And now I see y'all talking about people, there are many who are confused. I've seen some say we need to show more patriotism to engage workers. Which workers? Whenever people say that, I'm like, which workers do you mean? Like which are the workers that we're gonna get by being American patriots? It's not African people. It's not indigenous people. So you must mean a particular segment of workers. Whom, whom do you mean that we have to be American nationalists to attract because my experience is that if you talk to like regular 
poor and working class African, indigenous, Chicano colonized people about the United States empire, you're not gonna have to say much. They have their own very clear criticism. They understand quite clearly, especially if an immigrant or an indigenous person or an African person, they're saying quite clearly this place is not for them. You barely have to say anything. So when people are like, we have to be patriotic, we have to be American nationalists to win over workers, I want you to be specific about which workers you mean, because you cannot possibly mean my people. You cannot possibly. Um, so yeah, let's see. Oh, I was confused. Yeah, I was saying, so I was not saying that we should be American nationalists. I was saying we should be anti-American nationalists and forth the lies about anti-American nationalism, making it a mainstream concept to hate the United States, to criticize the United States. We had over 150 people present for a flag burning in a family-friendly space. That is what I'm talking about. That is what we were trying to build. Um, so that was the New Mexico chapter updates. We got Pan-African Film Series, Saturday at 2 p.m., summer of 67. We got the event of the garden this coming Sunday at 4 p.m. We're going to be talking about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. And we have the Cuba Solidarity Car Caravan, Sunday, July 25th, 12 p.m., El Mesquite on San Pedro and Central. In terms of what's going on with the international work of the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party, we have, of course, coming up on July 31st, which is Saturday, a International Pan-African Women's Day webinar. An International Pan-African Women's Day webinar. Actually, let me open up the plan and like explain to y'all what Pan-African Women's Day is because not a lot of people know about it outside of the movement and it's very important because women need to get our shine. So Pan-African Women's Day is held annually across the world to celebrate the first Pan-African Women's Con Conference and the creation of the Pan-African Women's Organization in 1962 in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I believe that was the same year as the sixth Pan-African Congress that also happened in Dar es Salaam. So one year prior to the establishment of the Organization of African Uni, women delegates of 14 independent African nations and 10 national liberation movements met at the first conference of African women that took place in Dar es Salaam in, on July 31st, 1962. The organization that emerged from that conference was called the Pan-African Women's Organization, and the date of the conference, July 31st, was established worldwide as the Day of Women Pan-Africanists or Pan-African Women's Day. And so all over the world, every single year, APRP chapters and Pan-African organizations put together events to commemorate Pan-African Women's Day and the formation of that Pan-African Women's Organization. And so this year is no exception. On Saturday, July 31st, Pan-African Women's Day, we are hosting an international webinar featuring a panelist of young revolutionary women Pan-Africanists. We got a speaker from the Revolutionary Socialist League of Kenya. We have a speaker from Horn of Africa Pals repping Eritrea. We have a speaker from Burkina Faso, who is a member of the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. We have another speaker, oops, these Daisy. Oh my goodness. We have another speaker from the Amical Cabral Ideological Institute, which is an organization in Nigeria that works with the APRP. We have a keynote speaker from Udamu, who is the, which is the women's wing of the PIGC. The PIGC, of course, led the revolution against Portuguese colonialism in Guinea-Bissau that was successful. We also have another moderator from the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, and another moderator from Toronto. So we have, in this one panel, almost like the, the all regions of the African diaspora represented. We got Kenya, Azania, uh, Guinea-Bissau, Eritrea, Toronto, United States. Like, it's so, I'm so excited. Can you tell? And so we're going to have this panel of speakers facilitated by our moderators uh, talking about the role of women and youth in the struggle to build Pan-Africanism in the 21st century, talking about their challenges on the ground in their areas, whether it's Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Eritrea. We're gonna be talking about neocolonialism and how it's a major threat facing the continent. It's just gonna be an overall good time. We're also gonna have entertainment performances, spoken word performances from our comrade Abana Disro from the DMB chapter of the APIP, as well as some hip hop, some conscious hip hop, from Sister Kari J in the California chapter of the APRP. So we are trying to put together a truly Pan-African event, repping sisters, particularly young sisters in the movement to build Pan-Africanism. It's gonna be a great time. We're also gonna have translation um, into French, from French to English, and English to French, and then from Portuguese to English, and English to Portuguese. So yeah, come through. I just dropped the registration link in the chat. Please, please, please hit that link register for the Pan-African Women's Day International Webinar, and then share that link with your friends. Post it on Facebook, 
Send it to your email list. Tell your comrades about it. Please register for this event and make sure that these young revolutionary African women have a full house to share their brilliance. Thank you so much. So that you can register for Pan-African Women's Day at bit.ly slash p-a-w-d 2021. That link is in the chat. Click it. Click it and register. Other things happening with APRP International. Of course, we are just one of several APRP podcasts in existence. There are now a total of five that I know of. There might be more, but there are five that I know of uh, broadcasting every month or every week. First up, we have the Pantsula podcast presented by the Kaji Circle of the All African People's Revolutionary Party out of New York. They have new episodes Mondays at 6 p.m. Mountain Time or 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And it's quite frankly a brilliant show. Uh, some revolutionary African young men producing that every single week and talking about a different subject from an Nkrumah's Dupreya's perspective. So it's very, very good. We also have our comrade Ajamu, friend of the show, and his daughter Shakura with their podcast Sundays at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, again, a different topic every week from an Akrumas Tereus perspective. They are also very funny people, just hilarious people. And so if you want to laugh and learn, Ajamu and Shakura's podcast is the show for you Sundays at 5 p.m. You can watch that on APRP International YouTube channel or on Ajamu's Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash ajamu.ini. Also, our comrade Mzori, another friend of the show out of the California chapter, has the Revolutionary African Woman podcast she puts on with our comrade Halimatu out of Germany and our comrade Chenzira out of St. Vincent. They do that once a month on Saturdays. The last episode we shouted out last week, it was an interview with Mukasa Ricks and a sister from the PAC about the legacy of Kwame Ture, and it was brilliant. It was brilliant, so please check that out. You can watch it on the Revolutionary African Woman Facebook page. And then lastly, uh, produced by members of the Social Media Task Force of the APRP, we have the Forward Ever podcast, which you can listen to on Spotify. So Weekly Pan-African News is one of five separate All African People's Revolutionary podcasts that you can check out every single week. So please do so. And then please share those podcasts with your friends and comrades and on social media. So let's move it on to the closing. My name is Onya Sanwu. My comrade Monica was joining me previously. We are both members of the New Mexico chapter of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. The All African People's Revolutionary Party is a revolutionary pan-African socialist mass political party based in Africa, founded in Africa with chapters throughout the African world. And our political objective is pan-Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa. One unified socialist Africa, because when Africa is free, from the tentacles of capitalism, imperialism, and colonialism, African people everywhere will be free. We must fight to liberate our mother, to liberate ourselves. So this has been Weekly Pan-African News. We do this show every single Thursday at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. And you can watch it on our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, which means we will be back next week, next Thursday at 12 p.m. Mountain Time with another show, perhaps another interview, perhaps a political education topic that we'll do in depth. I actually don't know. We haven't planned it out yet. So please join us. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> please join us next Thursday at 12 p.m. Mountain Time. Also it's Thursday, which means shortly there will be new articles on the Hood Communist blog. We talked about the Hood Communist blog a little bit on the show today. You can read it at hoodcommunist.org. Please check that out. New articles every single Thursday. And then next week, we're going to have our next Hood Communist live chat in our Telegram channel. So please check that out, hoodcommunist.org. And please join the Hood Communist Telegram channel at t.me slash hoodcommunist. And lastly, I want to conclude by saying that if you are listening to me talk, if you can see my face, if you can hear what I'm saying, and you're not active in an organization fighting for justice, please, comrades, please, Africans, please colonize people, join an organization fighting for justice. Join an organization fighting for justice. We are facing the most organized system of oppression in capitalism that the world has ever seen. The most organized and destructive system of oppression and exploitation that this planet has ever faced. It is putting us on a crash course, a trajectory towards death, y'all. I just read an article this morning that said the heat waves that swept across the Pacific Northwest and most regions of the world would not have happened without the environmental destruction caused by capitalism. They were a direct consequence of catastrophic climate change. Previously, a heat wave like that, scientists said, would have happened once every thousand years. 
Now we are looking at a future where a heat wave, where temperatures are going to be at 150 degrees in Portland, Oregon. We are looking at a situation where that's going to happen once every five to 10 years. So we went from once every thousand years without climate change for those heat waves to once every five to 10 years, thanks to catastrophic climate change caused by environmental destruction under capitalism. Do you know what that means? Did you see what happened? There were power lines melting, y'all. People lost power for days. People suffered heat stroke and died in their homes by the hundreds. We are not equipped as a species or as a society to deal with what is coming. And capitalism has no plan. There is no plan. It's going to be very bad. We have to stop capitalism or capitalism is going to stop us. And the only way that we stop capitalism is if we join revolutionary organizations fighting to destroy it and build a better society, a socialist society. It is a life and death question. It is not a matter of, do I have the time? Do I have the capacity? Can I deal with other people on a collective basis? I understand. But it's not a matter of your individual needs. It's a matter of, do we want to survive as a species? Do we want to live for centuries more? Or do we want to wipe, us, wipe out ourselves and most of the life of this planet within 50 years? Like, these are the options, y'all. I choose life, which is why I'm in a revolutionary socialist organization, and I hope you will choose life too. Join an organization fighting for justice. Help us defeat capitalism before capitalism takes us out. If the organization you want to see does not exist, then please build that organization. To build an organization, you do not need expertise. You do not need experience. You don't need a specific analysis. You just need a couple of friends and a shared vision for change. That's all you need. So if the APRP is not for you, if all the organizations for some reason that exist are not for you, then start an organization doing what you want to see in the world. But either way, we must all be active in organizations fighting for justice. We must all be active in organizations fighting to defeat capitalism because the choices literally are life and death and not an easy death, a very, very hard death. So I just want to end with that. Thank you so much for joining us. Please stay tuned for a very good song and some flyers for upcoming APRP events and have a good rest of your day. Beat God. Where my nappy headed girls at? Don't let nobody tell you that you're not a queen and that you don't wear a crown. Let's go in time for my nappy headed girls. My naughty headed girls. Green scalp with the coconut oil. Some foil. Put your crown on, put your crown on. 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 Put your crown on, put your put your crown on. I'm a black girl, thick and stack girl, made from scratch girl. I'm the unmatched girl. Hard like a diamond, real like a pearl. Hips wide, cause I gave birth to the world. Pat your throat, pat your throat. Pat your throat, pat your throat. Shake your tread, 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 shake your tread. Braid it up, 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 braid it up. Twist out, twist out, twist out, twist out. One time for my nappy headed girls, my naughty headed girls. Free scalp with the coconut oil. Put your crown on. We got that magic hair, that just that water hair, that braid and twist hair, fist up, resist hair, defies gravity, don't need no vanity. Wash and go all your love, wash me flow, pat my fro. Catch your fro, 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 catch your fro. Shake your tread, 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 shake your tread. Braid it up, braid it up, braid it up, braid it up, braid it up. Put your 